Uh, Retreat is one of my favorite weekends in all of the year. Time to set aside to not just have fun together, not just spend more quality time together growing closer, but it's a time where God calls us here to do a work in our hearts. I, I don't know why you're here this weekend. I can take some guesses. You might be here for the scavenger hunt, for the sleepover with your besties. You might be here for the trampoline park. You might be here for the sessions. No, I know you. I got you. But you may not realize it, but God has you here this weekend for a purpose. While you're here, you think you've got other reasons going on, and, you know, those reasons I'm sure are going to happen. God has orchestrated this weekend to happen so that you would be here. The circumstances would align so that you would be sitting in that chair right now, ready to hear what his word has to tell you. Because God is going to do a work in your heart and life this weekend through the preaching of his word through the time of singing, through the time of small groups, through the encouragement of the other believers in this room. And it's going to have one of two effects. There's no neutrality when it comes to God's Word. It's either going to draw you closer towards Him, or it's going to callous you to draw you further away from Him. But God's Word is never neutral. And so I've been praying for this weekend. Your leaders have been praying for this weekend. Your deacons and all of your church members have been praying for this weekend, praying for you because they know how important this time is. So if I can encourage us tonight, this weekend, let's take advantage of these times together, the times to learn from God's word, to respond to the conviction of the spirit within and being honest about where we stand before the Lord and growing in our relationship with Him. We're going to start this evening in Hebrews chapter 2. I'll give you a head start there. Hebrews chapter 2, consider verses 1 through 3. And you know, a recent commercial has come out done by Apple regarding the Apple Watch Series 7. I'm not sure if you've seen it. It's a, it's a chilling video. Compiling together three real-life audio recordings of emergency situations. One of the calls features a paddleboarder who has drifted out to sea due to harsh and severe winds. He talks in desperations through his Apple Watch to the emergency personnel on the other end, saying that the, the wind has been so strong, he doesn't have any strength to paddle against it, and he's going further and further and further off into the sea, and he needs to be rescued. In 2017, there are two women who set sail from Hawaii to Tahiti, and after a few weeks out at sea, their engine failed due to damaging weather, and they began to drift off course. They were lost at sea for about five months until a fishing boat spotted them and emergency responded to them. But the boat was left behind, still drifting out at sea even today. What do these two different situations have in common? They were both on course. They both had a purpose. They both didn't set out that day to get lost and to drift away. They had intentional plans that they thought they were carrying out. But the paddleboard of the man wasn't strong enough to battle the waves and the wind of the ocean. Nor was the boat's engine fit to deal with the harsh severity of that weather out at sea. You know, this weekend, we're going to be drawing a parallel from the waves and the winds of the ocean to the waves of life and the winds of the world that will push and pull us and try to draw us away from God and away from the truth of his word and the gospel. And so tonight, just to kind of set the table for the weekend, we're going to see a, a severe warning against drifting away from Hebrews 2 one through three. A warning against drifting away from the gospel and what could happen if we do. So follow along as I read Hebrews chapter two. We'll look at the first three verses. The author begins this way. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward... 
How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? We'll look at this in two parts this evening, the warning of drifting and the consequences of drifting. First, verse 1 gives us the warning, the warning of drifting. You know, this author writes to a group of individuals who are facing persecution and, and difficulties in life, liken them to waves crashing upon their lives. And at the weight of the persecution and difficulties, they're tempted to take a step back. Take a step back from Christianity, take a step back from the gospel, from God and everything, and go back to what they knew before. That of Judaism and obeying and keeping the law, doing these specific deeds in order to maintain a good standing with God. And so the author writes this book, one of my favorites, to show that Jesus is better. Jesus is better than the old covenant. Jesus is better than the old law, the way that it used to be done. Jesus is superior to all things. And in our verses tonight, we see a call for them not to drift away from that which should be superior in their lives, that of the gospel and of God. In verse 1, we kind of get this vivid warning of this image, this picture of this ship whose anchor has broken loose from the ocean floor and it begins drifting away without able to save itself. You know, such dangerous drifting, we'll come to find out, it's never really intentional. It, it doesn't happen on purpose. And in fact, it most often happens because we're inattentive, because we're careless, because we often find ourselves pressing the cruise control button in our lives and just spiritually coasting, relying on things that we've heard in the past, but not actively pursuing God in this life. Normally, this drifting doesn't always happen because they're doing that which they shouldn't do, but more so, it's a failure to be proactive and merely allowing things to slide in their lives. You know, that church's experience some 2,000 years ago really intersects with our lives today because drifting is still a massive problem we face today. It's not so much intentional, but comes from apathy. Just not caring a lot about spiritual things. You're unconcerned about them. So it, it makes sense then why you drift away. Drifting doesn't happen just in a moment. It's not a split decision that you make and you get off course. No, it's the little decisions that you make each and every day of the priorities in your life that you kind of start to veer off course and continue going down that path. But how does this happen? What brings such drifting into our lives and how do we find ourselves off course? Well, there's lots of contributing factors, things that can happen in our lives, which makes it easy for us to get off course. The first is time. You know, it, being off by one degree doesn't seem to matter that much. Close enough, right? But after years, it can be devastating. You know, think of two gates side by side at the airport, right? One's going to Singapore, one's going to New York City. Some 10 feet away, but over time and over the distance, they end up in two completely separate locations. Another thing that contributes to this is familiarity. I've heard this stuff before. I've heard the gospel. I know it. I understand it. I'm familiar with the truth. Hearing something over and over again to where you kind of become calloused of its wonder and its amazement and its greatness. I remember when we moved here some three years ago. It feels like a thousand years ago. Some three years ago we moved here. We went to Sawgrass Mall. First time we were there, I'm like, what is this place? It's massive. There's so many people here. I don't even know how to find my way out of here, right? But then you go again, five times later, 10, 15 times now we've been, I don't know, I don't keep track of those things. But now I just go, go in. Go to the store I want to go to, get the item or product that I want to get. It's not spectacular to me anymore because I've been there so many times. Familiarity can breed this drifting. Another thing that can contribute 
to getting off course is the busyness of life. I mean, so often I'll ask you how you're doing or somebody asks me how you're doing. You know what a lot of people say? Busy. Just busy. Like everybody's so busy, right? Like your, your schedule is busy. I'm not doubting that for a second. Baseball practice, trumpet lessons, rehearsals, math club, homework, studying, friends, jobs, finals. The list goes on and on and on about the things that consume all of your time. And so you're just going from one thing after the next, after the next, the schedule, your day's over. Start the day over again. Get up, go to school, extracurriculars, practice, homework, bed, repeat, after, over and over, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Going in that cycle, the busyness can often consume us and distract us from the spiritual path that we're going down. The drifting comes when this combination of the years, the time, the familiarity, the busyness, it's revealed then when difficulty strikes. When difficulty strikes your life, it shakes you up and actually reveals where you have been casting your anchor at this entire time. So what do we do? I mean, it's pretty drastic needs, right? Like, yeah, I am busy. I mean, I'm familiar. I've been raised in the church. I've heard a lot of these things. I'm growing up each and every single day getting older, listening to these things, consumed with life. How do we avoid this? How do we avoid drifting off course away from God and the gospel? Well, God gives us the prescribed treatment to drifting in verse 1. It's paying careful, meticulous attention to that which you've already heard. Going back to the basics of Christianity, of the Bible. What have they heard so far? We're just in verse 1 of chapter 2. So what has chapter 1 been about to this audience? It's been talking about the supremacy and greatness of Christ. How Jesus is better. Jesus is greater than anyone in anything. Anybody think angels are kind of fascinating? Think angels are kind of cool? Like the idea of them? Yeah? Some nets, huh? Yeah? Guess what? Jesus is greater than the angels. That's what he talks about in chapter 1, verses 5 through 13. Think angels are cool? Guess what? Angels are created by God for him. They serve him. They worship him. How much greater is Jesus than any angel or any other being who's ever existed or who will ever exist? Going back to Christ as the number one priority in your life. Do you remember? Do you remember the the day that you first got saved if you've come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you think back to that beginning time, where you trusted in Christ, where you repented and turned from your sin, confessed your sin to him, trusted in him to save you as the only one who can. Do you remember that time? How simple life was? Everything was easy. Everything was happy. Why? Because God solved the biggest problem in your life of sin and you're standing before him. And you didn't get deep into the Bible. You didn't get concerned about anything else, but you were just loving Christ. You were just loving God. You were so thankful and happy, and you wanted to tell other people about this good news of what God has done for you. Everything was so great because the gospel changes everything. When you're so passionate and understanding of what Jesus has done for you, That chapter 1, verse 3 tells us that Jesus being the perfect image of God, he he purged and cleansed us of our sin and sat down at the right hand of the Father. See, what the author is pleading with this church, this group, is to not drift back to the religious performance of the law that they were doing before they got saved, but remembering the promise of the gospel of Jesus Christ that sin can be forgiven. Because of what Christ has done on the cross. 
Go back to the very elementary things which you've heard. So what happened? Why are we not still like that today? Well, time has happened. Life has happened. The busyness of your schedule has happened. Your familiarity with the glorious gospel truth has happened. To where you're no longer marveling at Christ. You're no longer desiring him. Because you're just kind of used to him. You've grown familiar, casual with him. Only turning to him when you need him, when things go wrong. So why is it important that they, that they go back and remember the basic tenets of the gospel? Because if you don't think that your sins have truly been forgiven, you're going to try to earn that forgiveness through various practices by your own human works. You see, friends, most everyone in the world believes that there's a heaven some don't believe that there's a hell, but everyone is okay with the idea of heaven. And most individuals think that they are going there, if you ask them. Very few people will understand that there's a heaven and a hell and say that I'm not going to heaven when you ask them that. Why does everyone think that they're going to heaven? Because they look at their life, they look at what they do, and they think that's enough to please God. And you know what? I bet you there's someone in here who thinks the same thing. It's the common, it's the common mindset of every false religion here on planet earth, thinking that you can earn your way to heaven. That if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, that it's some sort of cancellation process. And as long as you're in the good balance, you're in. He'll let you through the pearly gates. That's not the gospel. That's a performance mindset that I have to do, I have to try, I have to work. And what it does, what that kind of mindset results in is it's, it results in a rejection of God. It results in a rejection of Jesus Christ. And it results in a rejection of the gospel. How do you arrive at such a mindset? You drift away. You forget the basic truths of the gospel and of the Bible. And you drift away from it. And you know what? There, there are consequences for those who do that. There, there are drastic consequences for those who drift away from the gospel. And that's what the author describes next in verses 2 and 3. We've seen the warning very clear. But now there's consequences of drifting. Look at verse 2 and 3. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, meaning it's true... And every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? You know, verse 2, really kind of, the author talks about those who would disregard the law given to Moses, and how if they disregarded the law, there is consequences for that, right? But then how more disastrous would it be if we neglected the message of salvation which God himself has given? Verse 2, every transgression and every disobedience receives a punishment. I know it says reward, but every other translation has punishment, which is a better understanding this. Every sin receives a just punishment and penalty. So then verse 3 goes on to describe the, the ultimate consequence if you drift away from God and the gospel. If you hear the gospel, if you understand this, you do not accept it, you do not trust it, you do not cling to it, but you just stiff arm it and say, I don't want to have anything to do with that. What's that called? Neglecting. What happens? Verse 3, how can we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? salvation. How could you escape if every single sin which you've ever committed is paid for in full by you? Because if you neglect salvation, every single sin you've ever committed and ever will commit has to be punished on your account. Who can escape from the judgment of God for sin? 
Answer, no one. Who can escape and who can run from the wrath of God against sin? Answer, no one. If you neglect the gospel and you neglect this great salvation, meaning you're pushing it off, you will drown in the wrath of God forever in eternal judgment. Just like that paddleboarder in the commercial or the two women who drifted off the sea. If no one came to rescue them, where would they be today? Dead, drowned, never have escaped See, the author is writing here in verses 2 and 3 that you cannot escape God's judgment on your own. You will be condemned and you will be punished for your sin. But you know what? The book doesn't stop at the end of verse 3. The rest of Hebrews goes on to describe the greatness of salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. Why is Christ so much better than everything else? Because he endured the wrath of God on the cross on our account. So that those who come to him by faith, repenting and turning from their sin and trusting is him and and this is the only way, the only truth and the only life coming to the Father through him, finding all their confidence and assurance in him and not of themselves. The record of wrongs is wiped clean. The balance of the account of sin is wiped away because it was transferred to Jesus Christ. The rest of Hebrews talks about the greatness and the superiority of Jesus Christ in the new covenant because he accomplished all of it for us. For those who've come to him in faith. Why? Why would you neglect so great a salvation? Why would you push the good news of this off? Who would do that? Friends, really the same question could be asked of us in this way. For those of you who have been truly saved and forgiven of your sins, why would we go back to trying to find love and joy and satisfaction in the sinful world that we've been saved out of? It's because we forget because we drift away, not positionally, but in affection and desires and nearness to Christ relationally. Notice the warning of this text. It's given to those who have heard the gospel, not to those who haven't heard. You see, the concern here is not for those who have outright just rejected the gospel. The concern here is for those who've heard it, but neglect it. Those who've heard it and yet ignore it that they're indifferent to its message. They're indifferent to God. They're indifferent to the message of the gospel. You know what? They don't really care. I have my own life. I get that religious stuff is for some people, but I've got my own life to worry about. What is that called? Neglect. Neglect of salvation. It really points, friends, it points to the attitudes within here. Our attitudes and our affections of the place which Christ holds in our lives. It really pinpoints the one who no longer marvels at the beauty of Christ. It's directed at the one who no longer has a desire for him in his word. It applies to the one who really doesn't feel the need to pray and draw near to God through these spiritual disciplines. You see, the one who is drifting back to where he came from, really has a little concern about his drifting. Say, so you, you may realize now that you're not truly and currently anchored to God's word, but do you have any care or any urgency to drop that anchor back down and hold on during this season of your life? Because I'm going to be honest, if you lack that urgency... I fear that you're drifting away faster than you realize. So the urgent question I want us to consider this weekend is what can we do to avoid drifting? You know, a lot of our conversation tonight and tomorrow is going to be on on us, on our human responsibility to hold on and to draw near and to stay focused 
But don't, don't misunderstand the scriptures. The scripture also give us the promises of God's role in our salvation and God's role in our sanctification and God's role in our preservation. And we'll talk about that Sunday morning. Know that that's coming. Because it's not all dependent on us, but we do have a role. And it's right for us to spend some considerable time understanding what is my human responsibility to persevere through this. And the answer brings us right back to verse 1. Giving attention to these things that we are now hearing. And what have we heard? We've heard that Christ should be supreme in our lives. That he should be the foremost anchor in our lives that we cling to, that we draw near to, that we hold on to. It's very, very simple. If you continue to actively love Jesus, you're not going to drift away from him. If you are walking intentionally towards nearness to Christ, you're not going to drift away from him. You're not going to drift away from the one that you continually and daily draw near to. It's impossible. But you know what? Our, Our loves... And our desires are going to reveal, and I'm praying that they're revealed to you this weekend. Our affections and desires are going to reveal what we're anchoring our lives to for joy and security. You know, so to give us a a quick application here, how, how do we drop our anchors down? How do we drop our anchors into Christ and the gospel and the word? Well, One way to to make Christ supreme in our lives is to prioritize the word he's given us, the instructions, the message, the communication which God has given us to draw near to him must be prioritized in our lives in submission to it. You could kind of even put it this way in verse 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have read. We're familiar with Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Sounds a little bit of what we're talking about tonight, right? But we also have to remember the verses which follow it. How does this happen? Verse 6. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and when they shall be the frontlets between your eyes, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. What is this communicating? That the words of scriptures should be everything to us. They should be everywhere so that we can't miss them throughout our day. When you give this kind of focus and this kind of diligent attention to God and his word, you're not going to drift away from him because you're daily, even several times throughout the day, reminding yourself of the promise of the gospel, going back and remembering that which you have heard, that which you have read. Your anchor is continually being dropped in scripture, reading and thinking and remembering and recalling and meditating on how great this salvation is that you're clinging to, how great Christ is that you're holding to, how he saved us from our sin. He's given us freedom from sin, freedom from our bondage of this world. He's placed us in his kingdom to rule and reign with him in the end. When you're consumed with those promises throughout the day, You're anchored. You're not going anywhere. But how easy, how easy is it to forget? One day, two days, a week goes by, neglecting, you don't read, you don't think about Christ, you don't pray. You're just caught up in the busyness again. It's so easy to get there. How quickly we can be drawn away into the things of the world by the sinful desires of our hearts. We'll talk about that tomorrow. But this weekend, can I plead with you that this weekend, let's be intentional about looking to where we are anchoring our lives. Because if it's not in Christ and the gospel, then we will drift away. I'm going to pray for us. 
We're going to sing a few more songs, and then I'll dismiss you to have some small group time on campus. Got lots of different rooms open. Let's take advantage of this time. Let's pray. Oh, great God, we thank you for this great salvation which you have offered all of us today. Father, I pray that those who have not trusted in it, for those who have neglected it, that they would repent of their sin tonight, that they would trust in you first and foremost to save them, that you would secure them to yourself as only you can. And God, for those who already belong to you but are drifting in really the nearness in their relationship to you. The relationship has grown cold. I pray that you would convict them. Convict them of the sin in their life, that they would repent and turn from it and renew their faith in you even tonight. So Lord, we pray that we would heed this warning that we've received from your word, that we wouldn't drift away, that we would recall our minds our hearts to the truth of the gospel, to the greatness of Christ, the greatness of your son. Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight and this weekend, that you'd be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.